uh, there's a common saying that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. The point I, that I'd like to make is to demonstrate there's a historical accumulation factor in these risks. And in this era of instantaneous news and fast media, sometimes we forget our quite recent past of, say, the last 40 years. For example, if you look at the frequency of natural catastrophes since 1980, there is a clear and accelerating pace of increase in the frequency of natural disasters, implying potential impacts on biodiversity loss, implying food disruption possibilities, implying large economic losses. So the point I'm trying to make here in terms of climate change is that there is a clear historical magnifying trend that we should be aware of rather than just focusing on year-to-year -year events. In terms of um, income inequality, this graph shows the top 10% share of total income. And across the most developed nations since around 1980, we also see a clear trend of the share of income taken by the top 10%. And that hovers right now in terms of income around 40 to 50 percent. Now, if you look at also the top 10 percent share of wealth, it's even ex more exaggerated, meaning that particularly in the recent past, as the global economy has focused on measures like quantitative easing and monetary stimulus, there's been an effect on increased asset prices. And the wealth effect of that has gone much more to the top sector than a more equal trickle-down effect. So clearly here, there is also a trend during the last 40 years of intensifying. Now, when we look at demographics, this is just a cartoon to demonstrate the predicament that most developed countries face today, particularly in terms of, say, government budget deficits. And what that means is that as you, the society ages, naturally, the younger generation, being smaller, will be providing less tax revenues to the government system, whereas the burden of the elderly for social security and medical costs will naturally have to increase. Now, this is exemplified by the Japanese current government fiscal picture. And it's not only Japan, it's, I think, symptomatic of many developed countries where we have a very clear trend of decreasing tax revenues and increasing national expenditures, suggesting and demonstrating a very big deficit a structural deficit. In fact, if you look at Japan, tax revenues only account for about half of the total national expenditures, meaning that the country has to borrow about half of what it spends. And this is not only for Japan, it's the case for many of the developed nations. So, you know, when we try to resort to fiscal stimulus, as being happening in many countries, we have this clear trend of fiscal deficit for the past 40 years that suggests that you know, furthering this will only increase the potential risks here. And I think, you know, most kind of dramatically, if you look at the overall picture of a country like the United States, and very similar to other developed countries, this is a picture of what's called total debt to GDP ratio. And you will see on the red line, that's the increase in debt over the past you know, dec um, century. But you will notice that debt growth and GDP growth 
are going together, which is good. That means you're borrowing and you're spending, creating GDP income. So that's sustainable and that's good. But if you look right around 1990, those two lines begin to diverge, meaning that you're borrowing more and more, but you're creating less economic growth. So hence that black line, which is the debt to GDP ratio, is increasing, and it's at, as Alex stated, over 300%. You will also see on the left-hand side that in 1929, just before the Great Depression, we had that spike on the left-hand side. That was the debt-to-GDP ratio just before the Great Depression. And you will see now, today, starting from around 1980, that that ratio is f far, far greater. So if you look at then not only the United States, but most of the developed areas, it's a similar picture that debt growth is far surpassing economic growth. And again, there's a clear suggestion here of economic unsustainability. You are borrowing more and more, and you're getting less out of it. So we call it marginal utility of debt is decreasing. To create one dollar of GDP, you're having to use more and more dollars of debt. So the point I'm trying to illustrate through these slides is that in this era of instantaneous news and fast media, we get sidetracked in looking at a finite point in time. But I think the bigger story here is that this isn't new in the sense of these risks building. It's been going on for 30 to 40 years, and it's also intensifying which then naturally suggests the absolute need for sustainability. And to disregard sustainability would be almost you know, illogical. So I think looking at that historical picture over the last 30 to 40 years is critical to, to see that big trend and the increase in this trend rather than just focusing on just the finite one-time issue. The second point I think that we can take away from this is that there is a clear in interconnectedness of these risks. And if you, you know, it's, it's not maybe too clear on the slide, but for example, what it shows is that elevated asset prices can lead to a sudden financial crisis, as happened nine years ago, leading to financial industry collapse, leading to social unrest, leading to political unilateralism. So I think we have only begun to understand this complex system of how these risks are all interrelated. And I think with the e era of internet and with much less resiliency and redundancy in our system, I think the unknown potential impacts of increasing risks and the interconnectedness again suggests why sustainable goals are an absolute necessity rather than a choice. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Although uh, David and I agreed that when we prepared uh, this presentation, we agreed not to be too alarmist, but <laughs> the underlying tone is quite alarming. But there is a bright side to this. Uh, if uh, we move back uh, to his last slide to show interconnectedness of this risk and development gaps, if I put another slide showing how our sustainable development goals, 17 goals, 169 targets, are interconnected. So the picture becomes very clear that challenges are being compounded because of interconnectedness. So one symptom of our inaction 
if I give you one example, the rising number of refugees. When Secretary General took over the United Nations 11 years ago, the total number of refugees, internal, internally displaced people, were slightly over 20 million. But today, it is 65 million and still rising because we have so many conflicts going on in Syria, Yemen, and elsewhere. So with each day, the number of refugees is growing, but refugees is the symptom of man-made problems. So unless we address the root causes, unless we mitigate this risk by starting to act to implement SDGs, these risks will not get any better. And the next slide will show how these SDG goals and targets are interconnected with each other. So good news from this is if we find a solution in one area, it can also provide a solution to other areas. So action can spill over positively, but inaction will only compound the problems. So with that, uh, now I'd like to invite uh, our panelists up uh, on the stage.